My name is David. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here, and we are in a new series. Uh, we're going into a series on Ephesians that's going to go all the way to Christmas. And you're like, that is a long time from now for one book of the Bible. Does that stress anybody out? Is anybody already a little bit bored with the series? <laughs> you're like, how many weeks is this in one book of the Bible? I promise you it's going to go fast. But we're spending time in this on purpose. The reason that we're going to take our time in the book of Ephesians, well, there are multiple reasons, but one of them is that I, I think that slowing down and taking time in a book of the Bible actually slows us down just a little bit more to the pace that God brings about transformation and renewal in our lives. Sometimes the struggle on Sunday mornings is you get an inspiring message and then an inspiring message and then an inspiring message and hopefully, hopefully an inspiring message Right? Hopefully they're inspiring to you and they're encouraging and they spur you on to believe for the transformation of God to come about in your life. And then you step out of Sunday morning into the rest of your life and everything's still the same and you feel the same and the progress is slow. And it's exciting, but it's slow. John Piper, he's a pastor and teacher, he was asked one time, when is it that you doubt when is it that you struggle? And this is a man, if you hear him teach, you would think this man probably has very little room for doubt and unbelief in his life. But his, his answer was transparent and very humble. He said, he said, I doubt God because of the amount of time it's taking for my own sanctification. In other words, the amount of time it's taking for God to transform my heart to be a man of the spirit instead of a man of the flesh. It's taking so long. And this is a man who preaches with conviction and beauty and anointing and grace and power. And, and, it, and it's intimidating. And you're like, man, he's probably got nothing going on in his life. But even he said, the amount of time it takes for God to get my attention and bring about the change that he speaks of in the word, it, it, makes, me question, it makes me question what's going on. And he said, it doesn't make me question God, it makes me question my love of God. And, and he kind of dove into what that means. But, but that's why we're going to do this kind of slow. We're going to take our time so that, we, so that while we believe God for immediate results, we don't get disappointed, distracted, or run away from him heartbroken if it takes a little bit of time for our heart and our soul to line up with what God is doing in our lives. Amen? All right. So we're going to take our time in this book of Ephesians. I also want to take our time in it because sometimes we'll isolate a passage from the rest of Scripture. And one of the benefits of preaching all the way through a book of the Bible is that, is that we see that it's actually one work. The reality is the book of Ephesians, as much as we're lifting it up for a moment and we're going to look at it, uh, and, and we're going to almost isolate it, but we don't ever really fully isolate it because it's part of, it's part of the Bible, and that's God's full story, the meta-narrative, people call it. It's a story that goes from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation, telling the same story from a whole bunch of different perspectives over a long period of time. And, and so we, the book of Ephesians doesn't even stand alone, but we'll see that verse 1 in chapter 1 of Ephesians doesn't stand alone from the very end of the book of Ephesians in chapter 6. They're all connected. And so I'm calling this series Chosen. Yes. Chosen. And, and, and that's also the title of today's message. Chosen for a different life. Because, because this theme of being chosen is going to work its way all the way through Scripture. And it's going to help us understand how to apply it to our lives. Not as a distant reality, but, it, but as, a, as, a, as a present uh, promise that's available to us if we would just lean into it. A little bit. Today we're going to cover uh, 14 verses. Okay, I know that sounds like a lot. But the reason we're going to cover 14 verses, and we're going to do it quickly, is because when Paul wrote this, he actually, when he wrote it, he wrote it in one sentence. It was one long run-on sentence because Paul was so excited about what he had to say to the church in Ephesus that he couldn't contain himself and he just floored it and kept going. And so 14 verses, 250 something words, depending on which translation of the Bible you're reading. It, it, he, it's the length of the Gettysburg Address in one sentence because Paul didn't want to take a breath because he was afraid if he, if he missed a breath, we would miss what he was saying to us because the goodness of God was on display in such a, a remarkable way in his heart and mind, he didn't want anybody to miss it. 
Before we jump into the word, there's one more thing that I want to do. And I actually, you know what, let's read it. And then I'll give you some context for why Paul wrote this letter and who the church in Ephesus was and who it was made up of. And then we'll jump into the promise of the gospel and how Paul describes it so beautifully in this message. So it's Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. It's going to go up on the screen so you can read it with me. Um, But I'll read it from my Bible right here. He says, I, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption uh, to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. According to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he's blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as in him things in heaven and in things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having having been predestined according to his purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that so that we who were, <laughs> who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is God's word to us. Father, wake us up to the reality of your loving kindness towards us to the beauty of the gospel that's offered to us because you are so gracious and merciful to us. Open our eyes to to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to comprehend what it is that you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, that's a lot. It's a mouthful. And if you're not familiar with the passage, if you're not familiar with the Bible, if you're not familiar with this translation of the Bible, it was maybe even too much. But don't worry, we're going to break it down, we're going to make it real plain, and we're going to see the goodness of God on display for all of us today. All right? So the the church in Ephesus was a lot like uh, the the church in Denver. It was was a a place of commerce. It was a place of influence. It was in the West. It was actually in modern-day Turkey, on the West coast of modern-day Turkey, and, and we find ourselves in the West. It, there was the worship of all kinds of different gods, but there was one prevailing God that outsized all the others, and it was, it was marked with this temple. And this temple is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. You might have heard of it. It's called the Mile High Stadium. <laughs> no, for us, it's Mile High Stadium. For them, it was, for them, it was the temple of Artemis, or the temple of Diana. And it was, this, it was this woman deity who they worshipped. And it elevated, it, it elevated in some ways the stature of women to an appropriate place. But then it exceeded that and it turned into the worship of women. And so the worship of women became something that was prominent in that city. I'm not saying that that's the issue here in Denver. But, but that's what's going on in their space. And so in this, in this church in Ephesus, the, the church was being formed by a lot of people who came from different backgrounds and different kinds of cults and different variations of the same pagan worship services and, and all kinds of different religions. And they were coming together in the same place. And Paul is writing this letter to get everybody on the same page so they can figure out how do we live out this thing called Christianity? Now, they didn't call it Christianity. They call it just the way. They called it just following Jesus. They have called it worshiping God. How do we do this thing? How do we worship the God in unity with Jesus being the one who revealed the greatness of God to us? How do we do this? Because everybody had their own ideas. This reminds me of um, when, I was a, um, when I was in uh, college, I did this exercise, and it was supposed to help us learn how to, how, how, about how complicated cross-cultural communication is. And in this, in this game, um, or trap, as I would rather call it, in this trap, they handed out, we all sat at tables, and they handed out the rules, and we read the rules with our table together out loud, and we all agreed on what the rules meant. And we loved it. We were like, oh, this will be a really fun game. 
So we do these things with the cards. This is high value. This is low value. This is a trump card. It wins everything. And, you know, go to uh, pass go. Don't collect $200, whatever. Like, and then... And then if you win, you go to the right. If you lose, you go to the table to your left. And so after you play five rounds of this, everybody's going to move. And so we play this round, and then, and then the professor ups the ante. He goes, okay, now that you've got the game, don't speak anymore. You've got to do the rest of the game without talking to each other. And so we start playing the game, and we're having fun, and we're laughing, we're having a good time. And then it was time for the winners to, and the losers to depart. And that's where things got a little bit weird. So we play the game again, but now there are five of us at the table, but, but every two of them don't seem to agree with the other three of us about how this should work, and they don't even agree with each other about how it should work. But we're not allowed to talk. We're just supposed to play the game. So how do you figure this out without talking to each other? And so we kind of get through it, and then there's a little bit of an argument as to who should go and who shouldn't go to the other tables. And so finally, you're just kind of like silently and non-verbally being like, whatever, I'm moving on. I should tell you, this was for my master's uh, program, and so it was a bunch of pastors in the room <laughs> from all over the world. And we're in this room, and then we pass along. And then two new people joined our table. And so now we have a new combination of winners and losers and people who are just kind of middle of the, middle of the, middle of the way, just kind of making it through, trying to survive the game to the end. Because if you survive the game to the end, you get the greatest prize. At least that's what my directions said. But nobody else's directions said that. Other people's directions said that if you get the most points, you win the prize. Other people's rules said that if you have the least number of points, you win the prize. And so we found ourselves not able to communicate well because we were all operating by a different set of rules. And we had to decide who was winning and who was losing based on what we thought was right. And then we had to figure out how to play this game and enjoy it together. And I will tell you it's absolute chaos and I still hate some of those people with all of my heart. And if I see them again, we will, have, we will have words. Because it was so stressful. Because we all had an idea of how the game should be played. And everybody had a different idea of how the game should be played. That is why we have the book of Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, Paul doesn't offer any specific correction to anybody. He just sets the framework for what it looks like to live in light of the resurrection. So in light of the fact that Jesus died and rose from the dead, what should our lives look like? And that's what he's setting out to answer in this. Now, in a lot of other books of the Bible, he deals very passionately with problems that existed in the church. In First and Second Timothy, he talks to Timothy, who's the pastor of the church in Ephesus, and he's like, hey, you got some crazy stuff going on. you got to get it right. Train people to stop fighting over foolish controversies. This is how I want you to, to teach people how to interact as families. This is how they should interact as brothers and sisters. This is what I want you to do. And so that's what the book of First and Second Timothy does. And, and that's also in the book of Revelation. We learn a little bit more about this church in Ephesus. And in the book of Revelation, John writes to the church and he says, You're doing really well. You're enduring persecution. You're doing well. But I have this against you that you've left your first love. That even though you're sticking with Jesus, even though you're sticking with one another, love seems to be absent. The passion for one another and the passion for God seems to be empty. I want to tell you, it's not enough just to show up on Sunday morning and sing a song because it's Sunday. But God wants not just our words. He wants not just our attendance, but he wants our hearts also. And he's reaching out to the church at Ephesus and he goes, don't, don't compromise by just showing up. But bring your heart with you. So that's the church of Ephesians, uh, the church of Ephesus, or the church in Ephesus. It was a powerful, significant place, much like Denver is. And the church was being impacted by all these external forces that were pressing on it, trying to draw it where they would want it to go so that it could serve them the way they wanted the church to serve them. We've seen that problem today, where we want the church to serve us and what we want. And then we get ticked off when it doesn't do exactly the way that we want it to. And we're like, I'm out. That friendship wasn't the friendship that I needed it to be in that moment. I'm out. The church doesn't have the same priorities that I've got. I'm out. And Paul's trying to produce in them a spirit of unity that will carry them through the difficulty that God knew was coming to them. And he wants to stoke their hearts. And this is why this remarkable run-on sentence kicks off 
this letter that he wrote to the church of, of Ephesus so that he could stir alive the flame of hope, the flame of faith, the flame of anticipation of the goodness of God being realized. Okay, so, so let's jump into this. One of the most remarkable things about this ginormous run-on sentence, and this is where we break it down, is that in it, we've got these verbs of what God did for the people to, to highlight what the gospel is. And these verbs describe the way that God has reached out to humanity to draw him to himself. And I want to talk about these verbs as they appear here in, in, this, in this first 14 verses of this letter. Okay, Because the reality is either we will live according to the resurrection and the promises of God that we're about to find out about. Or we risk living according to uh, our own thoughts about what it means to be human and what it means to walk with Jesus. Okay? The first one is that God blessed. It says, it says in verse 3, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What does it mean to be blessed? I'm so glad you asked. I had one pastor recently I heard he describes being blessed as having God working actively on your behalf. How beautiful is that? He wants the church in Ephesus, and I need you to know today that to be blessed is not to have all of the money. It's not to have the best family or the best job or the nicest cars or the biggest house. To be blessed by God is to have him actively working on your behalf. And what do I mean by that? Yes, he works to protect you. Yes, he works to sustain you. Yes, provision is a part of that. Yes, having your needs met and, and having the ability to meet other people's needs uh, as a part of God's generosity towards you is significant and an important sign of his blessing on your life. But he's saying, no, 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 no. In, in the God of the Bible, we don't have an absentee God. We don't have an absentee Father God. We have a God who is working actively on your behalf. And not because you've done something to earn it. Not because you were good enough. Not because you, you gave enough money or you showed up enough times or you served enough times. It's because he loves you that he gave. And because he loves you that he works actively on your behalf. And then he, we keep going in this verse and we see that God chose us. God chose us, even as he chose us in God, before the foundation of the world, that he should be holy and blameless before him. That, that in a world where, where you feel looked over, in a world where you don't feel seen, in a world where you don't feel loved, in a world where you have to perform enough to get the affection of the people that you need affection from, he says he chose you before it all started. God, with all of his foresight and all of his foreknowledge of how things were going to go, I promise you, God was not surprised by what happened in the garden. Sometimes we think that, like, the, 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 the death and resurrection of Jesus was an afterthought. Like, God created everything. He created man in his image. And he's like, I want you to bear my image and dis distribute my love all over the face of the earth. And then, and then after you do that, um, then everybody's going to know that I'm loving and kind and merciful and compassion. And then, and then Adam and Eve ate from the apple. And God's like, dang it. I wasn't counting on that. Shoot. They foiled my plan. I chose them and everything. They messed this. I chose them, but they messed it up, and now I can't choose them anymore. Now, the beautiful news of the gospel is that he chose us knowing that we were going to fall. He knows the distance our heart is from his heart. He knows that we prefer ourselves over our preference of him. He knows that we want to do what we want to do, not what he wants us to do. I remember talking to one of my kids one time, and I was like, hey, look. You need to change this up because you're crazy right now. My kid's like, I want to do what I want to do. I was like, yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> like, I told, that totally resonated with my own heart. Like, I want to do what I want to do too. Yeah, like, yeah, let's, let's, let's sit down and talk about that. <laughs> like, like, my God, you just identified all the problems with my life right now. Like my pastor child, just helping dad realize why things were so chaotic in my life. It's because I want to do what I want to do. Can I get an amen? amen. I hope that was for yourself and not for me, but it's cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> you're like, yeah, he definitely wants to do whatever he wants to do. I get that sense from him. 
<laughs> but before the foundations of the world, he chose us. Knowing that sin was going to enter the world. Knowing that we were going to be drawn away from him. Knowing that we were going to struggle to love him and struggle to love one another. And we were going to do everything in our power to do what we want to do and, and live according to our own design and plan for our life. He chose you knowing that. If I had known all the ways that I was going to disappoint Megan when we said yes to each other at the altar, I promise you there's a 0% chance she would have said yes. Because we say yes not knowing the chaos that's coming, right? You chose not knowing how deep it went. It was kind of cute, and then you see it, and it's like not so cute. You're like, oh, yeah, it's cute how he does that. Not, no, not 16 years in, it's not. <laughs> right? Like, I thought you were, I chose you because you were, I thought you were going to grow out of it. Right? I, th I thought, so yeah, don't amen if your spouse is next to you. Just, he was amening that my life is a mess. That's all it was. He was just, he was just talking about my life. And that's cool. That's, I put my life on display for you. So, you, man, you're driving home. Pastor David, his life's kind of messed up. Like, we've got hope, don't we? <laughs> We wouldn't have said yes, but Jesus said yes knowing all of this about us. And Paul wants them to know that, that, you, that we are chosen. I think that's the number one lie that confronts us about the love of God. Is that we think that we can't live up to it. And this is where the lie is. The truth is that we can't live up to it. But the lie is that he's rejected us because we can't. That's the whole purpose of Jesus coming, was to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And to invite us into a journey of knowing him, of trusting him, of walking with him and allowing him to bring about the transformation in our heart that can't be done with any change of thought and, and thinking a better life and, and, you know, multiple steps towards a happier, healthier you. He wants to give us what's only possible for him to give us in his choosing of us. And he chose us for a specific purpose, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Again, something we can't do, that he desires to do in and through us on his behalf and for us. The next verb is that God destined or predestined, if you're a Calvinist. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you don't understand the shot I just fired, there are two major camps there are two major camps in Christian theology, and, and I'll introduce you to them so I mess up your life. It's, it's Arminianism and Calvinism. So we're just going to do it. It's just helpful. It's just not helpful. I remember one time I was leading this outreach, and I was a college student reaching out to a bunch of seniors at a, a local high school. And this kid goes, well, are you an Arminianist or a Calvinist? And I had no idea what he was talking about. I was like, I'm a Christian. I don't <laughs> Like, I had no clue that he was talking about, well, how do I think about the, the, the foreknowledge and the, and the, the, the uh, predetermination of our salvation in our lives, right? Like, it was like, I, I, I'm a Christian, buddy. I, I like, uh, is that in the Bible? <laughs> like, where, what are you even talking about? And, um, but it's a really important, I'm, I'm laughing about it because, because I'm about to offend everybody uh, who finds themselves in one camp or the other. Um, but um, so the Arminianists are like, it basically, God will do nothing if you don't do it first. <laughs> like, if you don't pray it, he's not moving. If you don't believe it, it's not happening, right? And this is a caricature. I'm messing it up, and we'll get comments on YouTube from, yeah, people who are like, you're a jerk. And, and, then, and then we've got Calvinism who says, like, God does everything, and you're either his or you're not, and there's nothing you can do about it. So here's what I want you to do. After much study, <laughs> I believe it's probably best for all of us if we pray like Arminianists and rest like Calvinists. We pray and believe God like he's not going to move without us. But we go to sleep at night knowing that God is in control and his loving kindness is going to sustain us no matter what. Now that, that was two very crass, rude, effortless descriptions of those things. And if you want to have a, uh, a deeper conversation about it, we could have a small group and we'll discuss Arminianism and Calvinism. Both sides are welcome. We'll start a war. It'll be <laughs> wonderful. Um, no, it'll be great. I actually, I, I welcome the conversation. If you do have questions about it or you're interested in learning more about it, we can, we can talk about that. 
So God destined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. How beautiful is this language? He didn't just choose us, but he wants to bring us as close as you can possibly be brought. Now, adoption is particularly beautiful because in the adoption that's being spoken of here is that you who were once not part of the family is not just being welcomed in, but is going to get a seat of honor. And in a culture at this time where family was tied in with honor and, and not having family would have been dishonorable, Jesus is saying, I'm going to take the licks and I'm going to take your bad behavior and I'm bringing you in. It'd be like going to, a, to, a, to an animal rescue shelter and picking the worst dog. Like you go in and you're like, which dog is the absolute ugliest and meanest and it will probably should just be euthanized. I want that one. That's what Jesus did with me. He went to the ugliest, darkest, most insecure and prideful and violent dog he could find that should have been euthanized for its violence, for its pride, for its arrogance, for its lust, for its, for its rebellion. And he said, that's the one I want to bring home. But better than that, because we're not dogs. We're, we're people. And he came in and he sees us in our weak, rebellious state. And he's like, that's the one I want. I want the insecure one. I want the prideful one. I wasn't pointing at anybody. Actually, I, I actually pointed at Heather twice. But <laughs> she's our big faith friend. She can handle it. But he chose us. And he destined us for adoption. He didn't just choose us for some ambiguous purpose, but he wanted to bring us in as close as we could possibly be brought in so that we could be transformed in him. And God redeemed. In him we have redemption. Through his blood, the fragrance or the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So with his grace, what he chose to do was to redeem us. That is to purchase us from what we previously belonged to. What did we previously belong to? Ourselves. Now, I know that it's hard to talk about this without getting into the language of being owned by another person. And we're not talking about being owned by another person, which is absolutely wrong. But we're talking about being owned by the one to whom we belong to anyway. Because God is not like any other man. And his ownership is one of adoption and grace and mercy and forgiveness and love. God redeemed us. Now, I don't want you to get, we've got one more past tense, I think, and then, and then we're going to move to a future tense. But I don't want you to get lost on the fact that it is a past tense thing. These are the things that God has already done knowing what he knew about who you are and what you were going to do and who we were going to be. Right? But it's, it's not something that happened back then and is not happening now. It's something that happened then and continues to happen now because we live in the fullness of what was already done. Does that make sense? He signed the paperwork, and the paperwork is still good. Basically, as long as Jesus is still alive, these promises are all still good. God lavished on us. If you were wondering, in what measure does God love us? In what measure does he do these things? In what measure did he choose me, destine me, adopt me? In what measure did he foreknow? In what measure did he do all of this? He lavished it. He, he, he heaped it onto us. In, in the picture in, in Scripture, when people get anointed, and, you know, when, uh, on the uh, ordination service, we, we anointed Larry and Andrew with oil, and we just put a little bit of oil on their forehead to symbolize the, the Holy Spirit moving on their lives and, and empowering them to do what needs to be done. In the Old Testament, they just dump the whole jar on their head. They lavish it on them. They, they pour it all the way on so there's no mistaking, man, that person is going to have God working on their behalf. And this is the love that he loved us with. It was a lavish love. And God made known, making known the mystery of his will. What is the mystery of his will? That we would belong to him. It's everything that I've just been talking about. That we would be his and we'd be adopted by him and for him and to him for his glory to be revealed in and through us, not just as individuals but together. Because uh, something I failed to say in the introduction is that none of this is singular. None of this is about just you, but it's about you all. It's about us together being called and chosen and, and adopted and being lavished on by him. 
And God makes known his perfect will. Making known the mystery of his will. Now here's the thing you need to know about Greek mysteries. You don't need to know it, but it's kind of cool and it's helpful. Sometimes we want to know everything that there is to know about God and his plan and his purpose. Or we feel like we don't know anything. Anybody there? You're like, I actually don't know what I'm saying yes to. So I'm not satisfied to go in on Jesus because I'm, I'm frustrated because I want to know more. And I talked about not knowing more earlier, but this is a little bit different because in the Greek mind, a mystery was something that was already revealed. There were lesser and greater mysteries. And a mystery was something that, that even though you didn't fully understand it, you knew that it was there. Does that make sense? So a mystery in the Greek mind, uh, let's use the Trinity, for example, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You, you will never fully understand it. You can't grasp it because God's eternal. And, and there's not a metaphor that satisfies who the Trinity is. And, and it kind of comes and, comes and goes. It fades like the stars, right? You're like, I get it, I get it. And then you look at it, and it's gone. You're like, I get it, I get it, and you look at it, and it's gone. And that's kind of what the realization of the Trinity does. Has anybody ever had that struggle? You guys know what the Trinity is? Ish? We could have a small group about it. But, <laughs> so, the, so the Trinity kind of fades and it comes. But, but we get frustrated as Westerners. We get frustrated as 21st century Westerners. And we're like, we're like I want more information or it's not true. To the Greek mind, they go, it's amazing that we know that the Father was revealed as divine and the Spirit was revealed as divine and the Son was revealed as divine. I don't need to understand all of its inner workings to appreciate that it's been revealed to me. I don't need to understand the the intricacy and the depth of my wife to appreciate that she's in front of me. The mystery of my wife. It's going to take a lifetime to discover, and I'll probably, I'll probably depart this earth with pages unread. But he makes known the mystery of his will. So it's, we're not going to have it all at the same time, and we're not going to have it all the way worked out. And, and quite honestly, I don't know how you feel, but I don't want a God who I can completely figure out. I don't want a purpose that I completely figure out, because I, I'm trying to shortcut everything. And if I shortcut what God wants to do, I'm going to end up in the wrong place with the, without the tools that I need for that moment. Because he divinely prepares us for where he's taking us. And, and I'm trying to shortcut all the preparation because it's uncomfortable and I want, I want it now. And here's our future statement, that God will unite as a plan for the... So all of this was established as a plan... For the fullness of time, for in the fullness of time, he would unite all things in him. Things in heaven and on things of earth. And we, we kind of feel that tearing now. Or we feel that pulling together now. That, that in Christ, as things come together, in Christ, as things pull together, you feel this kind of magnetic force towards things that you wouldn't feel pulled to otherwise. To a purpose that you can't understand otherwise or appreciate fully otherwise without God having revealed it. And without God doing the work of uniting it. There is no good, there's no earthly way for people from all walks of life to walk together in unity without the Spirit of God. And we can start a conversation in a small group to talk about that as well. But for the sake of time, I want to ask this question. Do you hear him? Do you feel the invitation from him? As I talk about these verbs, as I talk about, about his invitation, as I talk about his choosing, as I talk about his destiny, the destiny that he has for you, as I talk about him revealing his goodness and his loving kindness to you for, for a future full uniting of something we experience in part now, do you feel him drawing on your heart? Do you hear him speaking to you? It sounds a little bit like, oh, I want that. It feels a little bit like, uh, I'm, done. I'm done with what I've had. I, what I've done has only gotten me this far. I need something different. The, 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 him speaking feels like sometimes it'll be like, just it'll sound like your own voice saying your own name telling you to come to Jesus. Sometimes it's a burden that it's like, ah, I'm done. I can't, I can't stay away anymore. I need to know this, Jesus. I need to know this, God. That's what it sounds like. And then the last question I want to ask today 
It's just how will you respond if you hear him calling your name? How will you respond if you feel the burden on you? There are many ways that you can respond. You could say not now. You could say yes now. You could say yes now in part. Like, but, but I can't choose for you how you will respond to the good news that God has chosen you. I can't decide for you and nobody can do for you what's necessary to follow God into that invitation of knowing his glorious plan revealed in this life, in, in this earth, in this time, so that you can become who he's made you to be in the very beginning. Paul wants the church in Ephesus to know these things because he knows that difficulty is coming. Paul knows that if they understand that they're chosen, that God is uniting them together, if they know that if they know that they belong in the seat of honor at God's table, that they'll be able to endure some persecution and some pretty hard things. They'll be able to endure getting a nasty text. They'll be able to endure getting hearing bad reports of things falling apart on the outside. They'll be able to endure the difficulty of financial, of financial pain and stress and difficulty. They'll be able to, under, to endure through every kind of difficulty. If they can get this down, they'll understand how to walk with with God in the midst of an otherwise chaotic world. So if you get nothing else, get this, that in a world that longs for acceptance, in our hearts that thirst for significance, there's a God who's chosen you. There's a God who loves you. And I know that if you've been walking with Jesus for some time, you're like, this is an evangelistic message. And that doesn't qualify for me because I've been walking with Jesus for 30 years. And I, I don't need this anymore. This is for the person who came in off the street or for a homeless person or something else. I would say, then you don't yet understand the good news. Because this is for all of us to be realized again and again and again. And that's the invitation is to realize it again.